guys, it's Dugan Dude here. Uh, this video is going to be a little different compared to my other videos, I guess. Um, I just want to do a review regarding um, regarding a video game series that I'm sure you guys know. And it's been something that has been on my mind for like the past few months. Shenmue. Why the hype? I've always wondered that myself ever since I uh, heard about Shenmue a little over 10 years ago. <sighs> Hear me out for a moment. Before I played Shenmue... I didn't hear about it until like 2007, when a friend of mine online told me about this game that supposedly like was one of the greatest games ever made. It was released in 99, there were only like two installments made, third one was in development hell, and people were eagerly awaiting the third one. Now of course I was intrigued uh, about this game, because from, from what I understood from the trailers, that you would be exploring this huge immersive world, right? Now, uh, of course, initially I tried to, I, I tried to play uh, the Shenmu games, but of course, the only way I could play them is through emulation. Now, uh, hear me out for a moment. Uh, not, not to get too sidetracked, but uh, I made a video regarding console emulation. Feel free to check it out if you like. But long story short, emulation should be treated as a last resort. Please support the official release if it comes out on Steam, PlayStation Four, or Xbox One. Please support the official release. Now. Uh, Moving on. Regarding emulation, initially I tried to uh, I tried to play it on my previous computer, which was kind of underpowered. I, I used a, a Dell laptop, tried to see if I could play through emulation, and uh, it, it, I couldn't really play it because it was just too laggy and the the, uh, the emulator was just too buggy at the time. It, it wasn't until just recently where I decided to give it another chance and I decided to actually play it. And fortunately, it actually runs uh, it runs a little better on my. Um, on my current computer, which is the Toshiba Satellite. Uh, yeah, it has Windows 10 and all that. So uh, I managed to actually play through it, and for the most part, I, I, was, I was able to play through the game like a good 80% of the time without any lag issues. And I was able to at least experience the gameplay, the story, the characters, the music. I mean, the game is just... The game is just impressive. Uh, I can describe the game as overly ambitious, inspirational, uh, truly ahead of its time. Because there's so much to do in the, in, in the game that you get so immersed by it of, of, over all the little details. Now, um, gameplay-wise, I should point out that uh, you're mostly going through the city of uh, Yokosuka, going through these little town areas of uh, Dobuita, Yamanose, Sakuragaoka, I, I hope I'm pronouncing them right. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're basically going around town. Um, initially, the game plays as a detective story. Because you're uh, you're trying to go through from like one place to another, and you're like asking directions. You're, you're asking for clues, you're asking for directions about going one place to another. And you're trying to figure out what's going on in this story. Now, the story itself, the, the basic premise is that Ryo's dad is murdered right before his eyes. And uh, this, the main antagonist, Lan D, kills him over a mirror. Then you find out uh, that uh, the mirror is somewhat like the plot device of the whole story. But it ends up being that it's not just one mirror, it's actually two, but the second mirror is actually hidden somewhere. So the main plot point is Lan D kills Ryo's dad just to obtain this magic mirror for some reason. It was, it's never really explained like what's the purpose of these mirrors in the first game. Now, of course, the game initially can come off as a little slow paced because you're just, you know, walking around searching for clues and you're just immersing yourself in the story. And speaking of immersiveness, the game itself is incredibly detailed. You can practically interact with everything. Be it, let's say, for example, take down a, a picture frame, open a, let's say, open a cabinet, open a drawer. I mean, it's not like a huge world. But it's incredibly detailed, and that is impressive. Not only that, it also has a lot of mini games here and there. I mean, if you go to the arcade uh, alone, you can actually, let's say, you can play a punching game, you can play darts. You can even play some old classics uh, that were actually made by, by the main creator, Yu Suzuki. Um, of course, you can actually play uh, Hang On, you can play Space Harrier, just to name a few. I mean, those are the the um, the games that uh, the creator previously made, and it was included there as an added bonus. But for some reason, it just doesn't work on the emulator. So, yeah, it kind of crashes. It <laughs> it has happened to me on occasion. 
But anyway, not to get too sidetracked, uh, the main character, like I said, has to look for clues here and there regarding like where this this murderer came from, what was his purpose, why did he take the mirror. Of course, then he later finds out like who was this person, what does it have to do, it has something to do with a Chinese cartel. Weird. Uh, then you find out that uh, you find out that this character but that goes by the name of Inesan Inesan is more like the mother figure but she's like the caretaker of the family yeah she's actually hiding a letter that the murderer left and the letter is written in Chinese so you have to find someone in this town in Japan who actually knows Chinese to actually help them decipher like what these things are supposed to mean these characters are supposed to mean in Chinese and of course, that serves as like more clues for the character to find out like where to go next. Of course, you you also have to confront sailors and ask them for information. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's a little silly thinking that an 18 year old Japanese kid can actually beat up sailors when it should be the other way around. But whatever, I mean it's I guess nationalistic pride, and Japanese, and all that. <laughs> whatever. Anyway, yeah, uh, Rio actually goes um, goes to these bars at night just searching for sailors so they can beat him up and get the information that he wants and of course that all leads to uh, other things that happen later on in the story that he goes to a harbor district where he has to meet up with some Chinese people that actually work in the harbor district and of course they have like more information regarding Landy, where Landy is located how to get there then of course the main character has to figure out how to get there he wants to travel by plane it's too expensive no he has to go by boat because it's like the most affordable thing he can get. That's mainly the, the whole gist of the story. Now, I should also point out that the game is actually split. The first game is actually split in three discs. So of course the first one you're just like running around in uh, in, in the main part of Yokosuka. I interacting with everyone you can find. Just just to see if you could, you could actually get more information from people. And of course you actually you have other characters to uh, interact with. Particularly let's say you have this hog dog vendor named Tom. This girl in the flower shop that goes by the name of Nozomi, who's a childhood friend of Ryo. Then you got Fuksan. Uh, Fuksan is like this, uh, a close friend, a, a sort of like a brother figure that, that was a disciple of uh, Ryo's dad. It, you get to know these characters more and more when the story progresses, and it's very intriguing. I mean, it it, it almost plays like a, I guess like a soap opera in a sense. I mean, the, the drama itself, you can... You get hooked in, like, where is this thing taking me? I'm in, I'm interested in these characters. What are they doing? It's like, you know, living their daily routine. And it's actually very intriguing, the, you know, having all these characters, not, not to mention the fact that they all have speaking lines. And every little detail is just amazing in this game. Of course, ba back on track, the, the whole storyline. By the time you're in the harbor district, you have to find a way to get a job. And of course, you actually have a, you, you actually find some ties with a, a friend, like in the harbor district, that actually gets you a job uh, operating a forklift and you're just carrying crates from one place to another <laughs> and that leads to a very weird like cart racing game with a bunch of forklifts so it is kind of amusing so um yeah eventually it just leads to the main character like saving up enough money to go to um to go to hong kong because he needs to fulfill his personal mission to actually go there he actually uh has to deal with other personal things too like dealing with gang wars, uh, saving his uh, quote-unquote love interest, which kind of irks me a little bit because it's one of those it's one of those scenarios where the main character is just so oblivious that he has a that the, the, the girl that he knows has a crush on him but doesn't really know how to express his feelings you're like it's like your typical anime stuff like the the dense male character and the female character who's just crazy about him but she doesn't know how he feels about her, and it's it's just a really confusing love story. I mean, long story short, they're they're childhood friends. She has feelings for him. He doesn't know how to react to the whole scenario, and there are some really intriguing moments in the story because, in in the third disc, you actually have to save her because she was kidnapped by a, this huge gang, and uh, of course you personally have to beat everyone up. Of course, after all that, he has to fulfill his destiny. Which is going to Hong Kong directly, so he, that he could, uh, you know, take care of business on his own terms. Let's back up for a moment and talk about the gameplay. I mean, the gameplay, like I said, initially starts off as like a detective game, you know, exploring every little detail. But then there are other elements where it actually like has this um, 
this fighting game mechanic. I mean, if you're familiar with the games of Virtual Fighter, it has a similar mechanic where there's like a one button for every command, say a punch, a kick, uh, a dodge, and a block. For the most part, those are like your main attacks, your, your main buttons. And of course, you have the L and R buttons, which are um, mainly to run. I, I should point out, the fighting mechanics, they work fine for the most part if it's like for a one-on-one -on -one battle in an open arena. But when it comes to uh, a, a very closed arena and you're being ganged up like five or six uh, fighters at the same time, maybe even more, the camera can get uh, a little clunky at times and... Um, yeah, it, it can stumble, it can somehow get in the way, it can just block your view. The original Dreamcast, the controller itself, never really had a right thumbstick. Unlike, um, unlike, let's say for example this, which is supposed to be like an Xbox 360 type controller, this is a third party uh, USB controller, or like a GameCube controller where you normally see a right thumbstick. Yeah, um, the Dreamcast never really had a right thumbstick for some reason. So it, it became a little difficult to control the camera during the fights because the camera would just do whatever it wants. It'll try to follow you, then it'll try to follow an opponent. And that's like one of the flaws that the game has. It's like trying to play Ocarina of Time without Z-targeting. It's just really awkward. And you can't really focus on who to attack when you got someone right behind you. That can be a little tedious at first, but you have to get used to it. Talking about the gameplay mechanics, uh, the, main, um, the main gameplay mechanics actually focus on quick time events. Now, uh, I should point out that some people usually associate quick time events to Shenmue, saying that they saying that the game originated uh, the quick time events. Not exactly true. I mean, quick time events have existed ab about as early as Dragon's Lair, if you remember that old game, you know, Don Bluth animated all that. So, um, yeah, the quick time events, to me, they're a little hit and miss because. Uh, it's one of those things where you just have to press a button in the right moment just so you can actually see the next cutscene. And sometimes you can actually like forget to press a button or maybe you're just, you know, you drop your guard, you, you're like immersing yourself into the story. And then all of a sudden you're forced to press the A button and the B button where you're not even have the control, you don't even have the controller in your hand. And of course you kind of miss what's supposed to happen. It, it can be a little frustrating. I mean, I've had my experiences with, um, with quick time events in other games, uh, particularly like uh, Resident Evil, um, Tomb Raider. I mean, it, it's intriguing, but there are some parts that just kind of annoy me a little bit. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's some it, it's the gameplay mechanics that you have to get used to in, the, in this. So um, it has its flaws, but it's still entertaining for what it is. And speaking of flaws, uh, I think the main flaw that the game has uh the english dubbing now this that's the thing i mean there are times where the, the english dubbing is fine but there are times where it just comes off as just cringy i don't have no more please let me be stop it and just who are you don't you know that blackmail is way uncool thinks you stop it let's say for example the main character rio yeah he speaks in a very stiff and wooden manner well, he's knocking on the door. He's like, bum, bum, perhaps they're out. It's like a very wooden, very robotic way of actually, you know, saying that. The dubbing just feels so out of place with some characters that it just doesn't seem right. Like if you go to the forklift area and you meet this character called Mark, and of course he's portrayed as this like black character and he's giving us a weird goofy voice. I mean, it's just, it's, it's weird. It just sometimes comes off as cringy. Good morning, everyone. Morning. On your mark, almost time to go. The funny thing is that I know people will probably defend the, the dubbing in the game because it has a particular charm in its goofiness. But that's really up to you whether you like it, uh, the, the English dubbing or not. That's really up to you. You can also choose to listen in the, in the Japanese format with subtitles. That's uh, That really depends on how you want to play Shenmue. Okay, the, um, the music, particularly the, the main theme, it's downright beautiful. What I can say about it is that just listening to it, it, it starts off very oriental, then it starts off as like mysterious, intriguing, then almost starts to be like a full of wonder and full of almost a bit of magic, I guess. The song is like one of those charms that the game has that actually sucks you into the story. You're always wondering like, where is this thing going to take me next? I feel like the music is also like a character in the story because it also like guides you, shows you the emotions, tells you how you should be feeling. 
I mean, the, the, the game itself just expresses so much. I was just overly impressed at the detail in the game. Regarding Shenmue, I do have to admit that the game really was ahead of its time. It was one of the best games ever made. Still is. It's up there. I, I can agree. It does have its flaws, like I pointed out, with the quick time events, the, uh, the, uh, the fighting game mechanics at times. Uh, they work. At times, it's a little awkward. As for the gameplay exploration mechanics, they're also very intriguing. And I have actually enjoyed the experience of playing Shenmue. And uh, of course, I decided to play through the, the second one. It never was released in North America. The game was actually uh, released in Europe, uh, aside from Japan. You know, it became like a PAL exclusive. And of course, the game eventually was released through the Xbox, the, the Xbox Classic, that I prefer to call. So uh, that was like a console exclusive. And the funny thing is that the modding community is so awesome sometimes. I mean, the English dubbing that was actually used in that Xbox version was somehow converted to the, the Dreamcast ports. You can actually hear the English dubbing in the Dreamcast port thanks to a mod. And that's pretty impressive. That, ju that just shows the dedication to the fan base. Now regarding the second game, which takes place in Hong Kong, uh, Shenmue 2 originally starts in this area called uh, Aberdeen, which is pretty much the Hong Kong harbor. Like right off the bat, the main character gets robbed by a bunch of thugs, accompanied by this little kid who kind of screws you over, and of course you have to like find your find your stuff back, your your bags, and inside is of course one of the mirrors that uh, the main character actually had hidden from uh, from Land D. During this whole story, very early on, you're supposed to like find out uh, like where's your bag, what happened to the stuff, where's the little brat that actually like screwed you over. You manage to find them, you beat them up, you find the kid, the kid gets your stuff back. the The only drawback is that, of course, they stole your money, and the only way you can somehow like earn somewhat of a living is by working through part time jobs, uh, particularly like uh, either participating in, in uh, arm wrestling games, participating in fighting events. Occasionally, um, doing other gambling games like uh, like Clucky Hit, which is kind of similar to that of Plinko. If, if you're if you're familiar with the prices, right, and know what Plinko is, it's very similar. But instead of like a, a a chip or like a token, it's actually more like a like a ball or a bead inside like a bunch of pins, and they have to reach like a certain slot in the bottom. There are other games, other mini games like uh, Roll It on Top, like different variations of dice games craps also this little like reverse roulette kind of game where you have to like roll a ball in the middle and have them like land on one one of the symbols one of the four symbols uh th there are a lot of uh interesting ways to actually earn money in this game during the story you actually like come across this character by the name of joy who is this redhead biker chick and of course she knows her way around town she actually uh helps you get a part-time job gets you a place to, to spend the night of course uh, it's, it's a motel but you have to like find a way to like earn the money so you can actually pay the debt in the hotel and uh, and of course like stay there regularly and during that time, you have to like find more clues regarding your um, regarding that letter that you got in the first game. That you have to find uh, this this character named Yonda Zhu, who is somehow connected with uh, Rio's father and the whole backstory of the mirror. You have to uh, find this other character called I think Li Xiao Tao. The whole scenario just involves uh, Rio finding a way to like um, experiment with other martial arts techniques, because in the first game he's master jiu-jitsu i mean he, he practically says it's jiu-jitsu that he uh, that he has learned but in this game he has to practice uh voodoo i think it is so rio has to learn martial arts techniques from uh first this woman called li xiao tao who's supposed to be like this um like the, this top master martial artist this female martial artist of uh, this giant temple rio has to find other uh former masters who have retired or still practice it uh let's say for example like one you have to speak to a bum in, in a mall Another, you have to speak to an old man who's just practicing Tai Chi in a, in a park. And you just have to find a way to, like, dominate the different uh, methods to voodoo. Like, trying to figure out, like, you know, how to be one with yourself. How to perfect your instincts, your your fighting styles. It, it's, a, it's a little complex. It's very profound. But, uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, you're preparing yourself for the big fight. And you're, you're learning martial arts techniques. Like, beyond the scope of what the character knows. During all this time, of course, he uh, he continues to find more information regarding uh, where uh, Yuanda Zoo is located, which eventually leads him to visiting other locations. One in particular is called Kowloon, and Kowloon was actually based off of this condensed city, this walled city that originally existed in um, 
in Hong Kong, but was later torn down years ago because of, well, um, it, it was more like safety reasons because the whole place was just a giant condensed slum that was like this building that was about to collapse at any moment that many people usually called home uh, back in Hong Kong in those days. Also, I should point out, this takes place like around 1986, 1987, uh, the, the gameplay of the, the first uh, the first and the second game. So mostly the second game takes place in 1987 during the time when uh, Hong Kong was actually a British province. So, uh, yeah, that's very interesting how that game takes place in, like, the mid-80s. Yeah, by the second, second, third disc, which, by the way, there are four discs total in this, uh, in, in Shenmue 2, you visit through the, the walled city of Kowloon, and it's actually, it's one of those things where it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, and it's a huge city. It has pet shops, it has a kindergarten, gambling areas, it's all condensed in this walled city, this giant building that is, like, this rural uh, urbanization and there of course there are also uh, a lot of uh, drug trafficking if you will i mean in, in real life that's what happened and of course there are a lot of gang members within the game in that part of the story so you have to find like more information regarding well, what these people uh, have to do with uh, this you on the zoo character eventually you actually find out this character you come across other characters that were former gang members that were helping out that uh, you know wanted to just steal for themselves why don't you like somehow live in hong kong with this crazy uh, gang filled scenario i mean not just in kowloon but in, in aberdeen the main hong kong harbor as well so you team up with this other character called ren who is a bit of a jerk but uh he's a somewhat likable jerk and he, he somehow like helps guide you through certain parts of the game you come across this character that is actually voiced by a woman in the english dub but it's actually a transvestite character and then of course you come across this giant uh this behemoth, this 350 pound monster of a man. You can see like the final boss of this like Kowloon area. Before you actually like fight him, you have to like, you know, come across other characters, other other fighters. You, you have to like get yourself in like these gambling rings, you know, try to get in contact with like this bowler hat guy, like in the storyline, where he supposedly gives you like information as to like where to meet this person. So yeah, you're literally going through town, uh, participating in these fighting tournaments, earning money, earning a living. Y you find a, a place to stay first off in, the, in a motel. Then you actually, you know, actually get offered uh, other places to stay. The, the supporting characters actually help out the main character in trying to fulfill his mission. It's a very extensive, like, uh, wild goose chase that happens during the entire, I guess, second and third part of the disc. Where you're just like walking around trying to find this guy, trying to find that guy. Go to the local tea shop. Uh, do this like tea sign that involves like these four cups. Supposedly to get more, uh, to get someone to, you know, fulfill you in and clues. I mean, it, it, there's just so much to take in in the story. I mean, you just don't know like how to express it completely. But by the time you like reach the end of the third disc, you find out that you have to go to a particular location. This small village called Yulin, I believe. That's when the fourth disc starts. And you are taken to this uh, small village, and you come across this young girl called Sheshua. And Sheshua is this character that has been literally like shown since the first game, and it's a character that isn't shown until like the beginning of the fourth disc of the second game. And this girl supposedly has like some connection with Rio, some spiritual connection. This Chinese girl that just lives in the village. Apparently, Rio rescues the girl. Who was trying to save this white goat from drowning in this uh, in, in a river during a heavy storm? And of course, he manages to save them both. And as a sort of thank you, the girl actually takes Rio to the village during a long exposition, uh, a few quick time events here and there. You're finally reaching the village. You get to know the girl a little more. Rio somehow finds out apparently her father was researching one of the mirrors, uh, particularly the Phoenix mirror, which is the mirror that he has, and the Dragon mirror is what the 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 antagonist has taken away. Rio is just trying to take it back at some point it's kind of revealed that uh, the the two mirrors have something to do with like some kind of a treasure Shenmue 2 goes from this Hong Kong kung fu action movie to something that just feels like it just came out of Indiana Jones it, it just has this strange mystery treasure finding kind of story and it, it seems a little awkward after uh, finishing the third disc and going to the fourth one 
by the time you actually like come across this uh, this cave where supposedly the the girl's father was supposed to be living in because it was kind of like a private area that was like for personal research. Then that's where they kind of discover this whole um, cave to have like more secrets than you initially thought, and it has to do with like the strange sword that was placed in there. Then it's kind of revealed that uh, the two mirrors have something to do with it. And by the time we're about to like see what these things are supposed to be about, like what does this all mean? To be continued. No wonder people are asking for a third one. The, the second one ended on a cliffhanger. And it's crazy. I mean, at, at the point where you're just reaching this huge climax of the story, after this huge ass hero's journey, you're gonna leave this thing in a cliffhanger ending because, well, there wasn't much funding to continue the story. It's, <laughs> it's hilarious just, just looking back at it. And this was like, I think, 2001, 2002, where the, the second game was released. But yeah, the game is actually like so profound, so d detailed, there's so immersive. There's so much content in this game that I can't even like express it all in one video alone. It's one of those things where you have to see for yourself, experience the game for yourself to actually understand it. In terms of gameplay and, and other things, the visuals, first off the visuals are just wow. I mean, you can tell how incredibly detailed the second game is compared to the first. Visually, it's uh, the graphics are comparable to that or maybe like PlayStation 2 at best. I, I do have to like point out one particular flaw that I've kind of noticed more in the second game than in the first game. The second game has this like rendering issue. The NPCs, the non-player characters, they have a th they have this habit of like like randomly fading in and out of the scene because of I think hardware limitations. And I would kind of forgive that in a sense, but it it can get a little distracting. Um, just imagine like you're, you're walking around town, you're minding your own business, then a sudden, suddenly an NPC character just phased into the screen. You're like, whoa. I mean, they, they, they kind of act like total ghosts, just like fading in and fading out of the screen. And it's all because of a, a rendering issue that the, the Dreamcast hardware, you know, it, it, it was exceeding its, its own limitation. That, that's always been like a sort of a tedious aspect in the, more in the second game than in the first game. Also, the quick time events in the second game. I do have to point out that they're a little more advanced because it isn't just like pressing one button. You have to do like this dialogue combo thing where you have to press, let's say, for example, up, down, A or left, right, X to actually do like this command. Otherwise, you have to repeat the entire scenario all over again, which can be ugh, freaking tedious. When it comes to quick time events, there are going to be a lot of trial and error moments. It can be a bit of a nuisance, but you have to get used to it. Otherwise, you'll never progress in the game. Regarding Shenmue, I mean, I want to say like so much more about this game, but I really can't do it justice just expressing what I can, like from my own perspective of the gameplay. Personally, I think the second one is actually slightly superior than the first one in terms of gameplay because there's just more more variety of things to do aside from playing arm wrestling, participating in these little fighting events, gambling, and yes, of course, the arcades from the last game, you know, Hang On, Space Harrier, Afterburner, I mean, it's more an expansion of the first game. And it's a nice little detail to actually add the stuff from the first game in the second game as well. But man, it's just crazy to think how this game itself, like the, the second game in particular, has four discs. And the discs themselves, think of them as like one gigabyte each, roughly. Those are the game discs on, on the Dreamcast. The, the first game only had like three. The, four, the, the second game has four, so... Put that into perspective, let's say like 700, 800 megs per disc. The first disc could be like 2.4 gigs. The second disc could be like 3.2 gigs, give or take. So uh, yeah, it just shows how much detail like these two games have and how so ahead of, the, ahead of their time they were, to be honest. You know, from my personal experience, I have enjoyed playing both games. And I have considered uh, maybe playing through them again at some point. Even if you play through them again, like a second time or a third time, you're always going to miss something. Another thing I should—I think I forgot to mention early on, um, th th there's this enhancement, this, this slight improvement that the second game has over the first, is that the, the second game actually has like a map in the bottom left corner, where the first game doesn't exactly have like a built-in map in the inventory or in the pause screen. Um, the map in the first game, you have to like literally find it in town, like the same way you would find a, a map in your local mall. You know, those maps will usually say that you are here. And it shows you the, the other locations of the of the other stores. Yeah, that's that's pretty much like the whole gist of it in the first game. But in the second game, you actually have like an option to, to look for the map directly. Uh, I highly recommend you guys check out uh, the original two games. 
please again support the games the official release on steam on xbox one on uh playstation 4 and here's hoping that we check out shenmue 3 i was initially concerned about uh Shenmue 3 in particular because well everyone has already seen the initial trailer and it's kind of criticized how wooden uh, the characters seem to appear but you know something the whole wooden nature of the characters that's kind of like the whole charm of Shenmue they were always stiff and wooden in some way for those who have already played Shenmue they already know what this is all about for the newcomers it gets a little you know hard to get invested in it I I'm a little cautiously optimistic about Shenmue I'm sure the third installment is going to do really well i'm just hoping that uh hypothetically speaking if a third one becomes really successful there could be a possibility of a fourth one i mean there was this big picture that yu suzuki had that it was going to take place like in multiple chapters and i think there was like a good chunk of those chapters explained in uh, in the second one and of course the third one is going to explain the other parts like i said it's best that you experience this game for yourself you're probably going to end up playing it two three four times it really depends on how many times you're going to do like your, your your Shenmue runs because there's always going to be something you're going to miss out on. I know this review is a little uh, mostly off the cuff, but I wanted to try something different, just express my my views um, on the importance of Shenmue. Was it worth it? I, I totally enjoyed the experience. I recommend it to, to anyone to check it out. This is a completely different um, experience compared to what you normally play in uh, in open world uh, games like Grand Theft Auto. It's, it's like the polar opposite. The best way I can compare Shenmue with Grand Theft Auto is that Shenmue is more order while Grand Theft Auto is more chaos. Shenmue pretty much teaches you you know how to be polite with others. You have to show common manners unlike Grand Theft Auto which Grand Theft Auto is you just have to kill and, and run over people and it, that's not exactly the the concept that uh, Japan is trying to imply. I mean, you have to be respectful. You have to show manners. You have to be kind. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to Shenmue 3. And um, I recommend you guys check out the first two. Just so you can get the, the main picture. So, uh, that's about it. I think uh, I managed to get my point across. Even though it's kind of all over the place. But, uh, yeah. Um, thanks for watching. And uh, maybe I'll make another review later on. Uh, something a little more um, compact. Thanks for watching. See ya. How about a game of Lucky Hit? You want to try a game of Lucky Hit? How about trying Lucky Hit? You want to try a game of Lucky Hit? How about a game of Lucky Hit?